Okay, more high yield information. Um, and and why, do, why are we all of a sudden getting concentration of this? And, and I think the answer is because remember that um, motor lesions produce negative signs and they're obvious negative signs. They're negative signs that are gonna interfere with a person's life. If they cannot move, make the movements that they want to and intend to move, they're gonna seek um, uh, medical assistance. Uh, with, with, with sensory disturbances, uh, one can still live their lives. One may not be as happy, but uh, uh, with a lot of them, one can continue to live one's life. With motor disturbance, with a, with a stroke that affects motor um, output, you're going to fall. You're going to trip. You're, you're not going to be able to, to, to make the movements that you need to, to have an everyday life. So in this video, I want to hammer home the difference in symptoms that are going to result from a lesion to a motor neuron. So it's a motor neuron the motor neuron axon, the neuromuscular junction, or the muscle. That whole, the, anything that affects the motor unit directly versus a lesion in a descending tract. And we're going to talk about, for the most part, we're going to talk about the corticospinal tract. Okay? So the corticospinal tract versus, the, uh, uh, versus a motor neuron lesion. Now, I, I, I want to reiterate that I use terminology or I do not use terminology that many clinicians use. So most clinicians will say that a motor neuron, the neuron that sits in the spinal cord or brainstem or hindbrain or brainstem and innervates a skeletal muscle, that is called not a motor neuron, but a lower motor neuron. And then the neuron that is sitting in the motor control center is called an upper motor neuron. This was a little sleight of hand. Uh, you, you can trace the origin of this, uh, of this shortcut way of referring to um, upper motor control center neurons. Um, it is not a terminology that I favor simply because the motor neuron is a very special cell and it really has nothing to do with the uh, cell that sits up, say, in primary motor cortex. But suffice that to say, you should understand that when I talk about motor neuron, I'm talking about what clinicians will call a lower motor neuron. And when I talk about a descending tract cell, a corticospinal tract cell, I'm talking about what clinicians will call an upper motor neuron. All right, so what are going to be the effects? If you lose the lower motor neuron, if you lose the motor neuron, you, if you lose the motor neuron, the axon, neuromuscular junction, can you move that muscle, the innervated muscle? Well, the answer is no. You cannot move it for any reason. It doesn't move um, because you want it to, so no volitional movement, but also no reflexive movement. There's areflexia. And because there's no movement, it's, that muscle is now under disuse. And the disuse is going to lead to atrophy. So the muscle will actually become wasted. It will become, it will look wasted. It will thin out. In that situation, there will be fibrillations and, 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 and also fasciculations. So there will start to be these twitches of the motor unit and of the, of the denervated muscle fibers. Okay? Now, in contrast, when you lose, let's say you lose the corticospinal tract, can you move volitionally? And the answer is no. So if I say, raise your hand, and you have a lesion in the corticospinal tract uh, to that arm, then you cannot raise your hand in response to me asking you to. Um, but do you have reflexes? Well, yeah, because the pathway coming in from the 1A reflex that's coming in to, say, cervical cord, and reaching motor neurons that go out to serve the same muscle. So the brain has nothing to do with it. Uh, the brain is not necessary for the core movement, for the core reflex. Moreover, as it turns out, when we lesion the corticospinal tract, we release reflex circuitry from a, an ongoing inhibition. So in 
an individual with a corticospinal tract lesion, they will have brisk reflexes, which, are, which is called hyperreflexia. And because there's, there's disuse because there's less volitional movement, but there's a lot of reflexes because there's hyperreflexia, and as a result, these two wash and there's no atrophy, okay? There's no atrophy. And fibrillations, fasciculations don't occur. Okay, so let's just take a look um, uh, at, at what I've just said. Here's a motor neuron lesion. Here's a lesion of the corticospinal tract. Can you make a volitional movement with either of them? No, you cannot. But reflexive movement present, in fact, hyper-present in the lesion of the corticospinal tract and absent, completely absent in a motor neuron lesion. Muscle tone, it's going to be absent. There's no, there's no motor neuron to tell the muscle to contract, even at rest. Um, there's, no, there's no ongoing muscle tone. The corticospinal tract, it will be increased because there's all this hyperreflexia. Uh, uh, the muscle appearance in a motor neuron lesion, it's going to atrophy. In the lesion of the corticospinal tract, there might be mild atrophy from disuse, but it's mitigated by hyperreflexia. EMG findings, there will be fibrillations and fasciculations in the case of the motor neuron lesion, but not in the case of the corticospinal tract lesion. And finally, what we talked about at the end of the last series is a release of one of the primitive reflexes, the plantar reflex. And a release of the plantar reflex is called the Babinski sign, okay? So the plantar reflex is unaffected by a motor neuron lesion, but uh, it is, um, is released by a corticospinal tract lesion, okay? Now, I want to say a, a, a few things. The first is that if, let's say that the lesion to the corticospinal tract is in the motor cortex or in the internal capsule, so pretty high up. In that situation, the person may very well still walk, still stand and walk. And that's not to say that they're going to stand or walk entirely the way that they did before their insult, but they will be able to. So here's a drawing of the hemiparetic stance. Um, and, and what you see is that this is a lesion coming from the left motor cortex. And there is an extension of the right leg and there is a, a, a decorticate posturing of the uh, right arm. There's a turning of the head away uh, uh, towards the side of the lesion and a turning of the gaze towards the side of the lesion. This is a very typical appearance of a hemiparetic uh, stance for somebody who has a cortical lesion, a, a forebrain lesion that affects motor cortex or the corticospinal tract lesion and possibly also the frontal eye fields. Now, can this person walk? And the answer is yes. Are they going to walk the same as they did before? No. What they're going to do is they're going to take this outstretched leg and, and this, is, this is a, I actually broke my foot last year and I had to work, walk with crutches. And when you walk with crutches, it, the cr crutch doesn't bend at the knee the way our legs do. And so as you bring it around, you have to, you have to bring it around. To, you can't go straight. You'll, you'll bang into the floor. You bring it around. Well, you do the same thing. The, the hemiparetic gait is the same way. The leg gets circumducted, circumnavigated. So you, you, you bring it out to get it to go around. So the final thing that we want to understand about these um, lesions of either the motor neuron or of the, uh, uh, of the corticospinal tract is that there's one exception. And here again, this is the exception that you will always be tested on. And the exception is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Why? Because in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, both motor cortex neurons and motor neurons both die. Okay? So when... Um, so what, what happens in ALS? You get a mixed 
conglomeration of these various symptoms. There is weakness uh, for volitional movement. So this is going to be a progressive disease. As the part, as the muscle um, control of a muscle group progresses, it's going to go from weakness to not being able to use it. Okay? So, uh, and it will go up from the, typically go up from the legs, but although it can start in the brainstem with, say, dysarthria dysphagia. Okay, so there's weakness to no volitional movement. There, as far as reflexive movement, there's hyperreflexia. So the hyperreflexia dominates because there are still some motor neurons, um, and this lesion is now releasing them from, from the, uh, uh, from the, um, inhibition. Uh, there's no muscle tone. There is atrophy. There's an atrophy in these individuals. And so this, this co-occurrence of hyperreflexia and atrophy is very diagnostic of, um, of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Furthermore, there will be fibrillations and fasciculations. These fibrillations, again, are, are quite uh, diagnostic, particularly when paired with hyperreflexia. And finally, there's a released Babinski sign, okay? So the, the plantar, re plantar reflex is released and there is a Babinski sign. So you should know that the exception to the rule that the, the effects of a motor neuron lesion and the effects of a corticospinal tract lesion are distinct and they occur in distinct patient populations, that rule is, is not obeyed by amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And it's, the, it's an exception that you have to learn. Okay, in the next uh, video, we're gonna talk about cerebral palsy.